you're listening to Pixelated Audio, and today James and I picked out another set of tracks we hope you guys dig for Expansion Pack 2. This is Pixelated Audio, and we're back with another Expansion Pack episode. I'm James, and with me is Brian. Hey, how's it going? Welcome back. And the track that you just heard was Wagyon Land 2. The title was called Final Battle for the Famicom, composed by Yoshie Arakawa. Wow, that's a cool track. Um, Wagyon Land 2. Yeah, no, I thought it was a really fun way to start the show. Really, like, very video gamey and uh, very high energy and just kind of just fun. And, you know, for a final battle, it wasn't like like epic it was more like oh this game is super fun so and you know wagyan lan is a is a pretty unique i want to say it's a unique game because it's very strange it's a it's right. a bizarre game I, I i remember playing it back when i first got into my like oh i got to play all these games that i never experienced it, you know when i was mm-hmm. in high school i went back and i was like oh man i never played all these nes games that came out in japan and yeah and uh you know i went back and played this and i remember playing the the first two i believe with my friend and um and i think i'm thinking about the right one here but it's a platformer right and you kind of run around it but it's a very bizarre thing like you play as a um it looks like a, a little dinosaur like a dinosaur yeah. or some some kind of he reminds me a little bit of the dinosaurs from dig dug okay like, yeah, yeah like those little guys and like, yeah like you said it this is a 1990 game so it was the perfect time for platformers i mean it seems some of the best platformers came out from the early 90s and right and this has a lot of i want to say kind of throwbacks to like mario type games right i felt i had a very distinctive mario feel when i was looking at this game and right and the the funny thing about the game that the what i remember being really odd about it is that um and correct me if i'm wrong here but like when you attack enemies you're actually like shouting at them and you're saying like wog and yeah and you power it up and you say like young or something like that and it's like it's it's so bizarre and i remember actually I, I couldn't tell you a ton about the game other right. than that I've listened to the soundtrack a lot, but the boss battles are very, very unique. Mm. And I remember um, at that time, I didn't speak Japanese yet, so it was I, I was just kind of playing it by ear, but I remember mm. that, I, and I, I could be totally wrong here, This could be I could be talking about the first game, but I believe the second game, the boss battles are actually, you get it, so you get into a boss battle and um, you think you're going to be like, boxing this this other opponent Mm -hmm. but it goes into this like fight mode and you're actually doing a memory game like a simon not simon but oh yeah yeah i remember that there was a a big like puzzle element to this game okay so i am talking about the right one i'm I'm pretty sure i didn't get to do a whole lot of research for this type of an episode since we're just wanting to kind of take the awesome random tracks and just throw them into an episode but uh i did kind of look it up a little bit because i wanted to find out you know this is a namco game and you know it's a 2d platformer and stuff like that and uh, i mean i didn't find out a lot of really interesting stuff except for at the end of the levels um there's multiple different exits i guess so okay so it had like a different level of complexity and more of like a, a replay value like oh i went through this door let me see what next time i'll go through the other door so i thought that was really kind of neat a neat addition to it that is cool because you know actually this this was never out worldwide this was right, never this was just a, a local release for japan so we never really got to experience this. It's never been on a virtual console or anything right. like Namco collection. Going back and now talking about it, I, it's like I want to go back and like at right. least cl- it, clear this. It this looks title like a because, fun series, you know. Yeah, like, it's it's a very bizarre one from what I remember because I, you know, there's certain titles that when you play they kind of stick out to you. Right. And Wagyang, just the name was weird to me, and I remember a lot about 
that game. There's a lot of games that are you could say that are maybe more well known that I'd be mm-hmm. like, oh yeah, I forgot totally about that game. But that oh game yeah yeah, there's a lot out. of charm. It seems like with the characters and the look and the design, the music is is really epic. Um, I had picked this track actually, and it almost got into our expansion pack, in our first episode. Um, but I decided to hold off onto it and save it for later because I thought it was just such a great track. Like I had said, it was composed by Yoshie Arakawa, and um, he's done the entire Wagyan series. He did Wagyan Land 1, 2, and 3. He's also done things like Tekken 1 and 2, which was you know, a little bit of a different for feel. The, for the arcade? Uh, I'm not actually sure. I didn't, I didn't get to see which okay. system it was for. I'm and then, sure it's probably the arcade because that's Namco's. That was their their baby you know yeah and i mean but he'd also done things like a star fox assault so it wasn't i don't think he worked exclusively for namco so So he was kind of doing some freelance stuff and yeah yeah. wherever his you know profession was needed at the time yeah i mean because he has a great sound it's very fun very fast paced um i really like the beat that was in the background It, it just was a track that that just made me feel like I was having fun and it that makes me want to play that game because especially for retro games fun is just always a great way to go I guess yeah and you know a lot of these a lot of platformers if they were good back in the day a lot of them hold up oh today. of course and it's so, sad that a lot of companies don't really make platformers anymore or any 2d side-scrolling stuff those games are just they hold up forever because they're just fun and you know they right. don't really deal with a lot of you know they work perfect for the graphical limitations whereas early 3d games are can be very hard to go back and play yeah. um whereas like you know 2d side scrolling stuff is just excellent no that was a great pick i'm glad you threw that in there and it's 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 cool because for me i didn't know what your picks were beforehand and right you know i'm kind of we're going into this together as like kind of blind box like i yeah i haven't i haven't listened to any of your tracks i don't know what you've picked and you know, makes it more fun for with, us at yeah. least yeah so anyways so why don't we go with one of my tracks next would you I'll, I'll give you an option here actually do you want to stick with the nes or do you want to move on to something else um actually let's try something else and we'll come back to the all NES. right all right okay mix so it up a little bit let's jump ahead a lot further into the the future here and we'll go with a ps2 track from 2004 and the game is called nightshade and the track is the menu theme heard the menu theme from nightshade on ps2 and that came out in 2004 published by sega and developed by wow entertainment nice i mean that's one of the things that i love about this uh, type of an episode is that is a super different track than the one that i picked and i really like it it's got that really kind of like club 
sound to it. And then I love that piano that kind of comes in and is like playing on top of it. I was like, that was a really cool touch. Right. And it's a ninja game, actually. It's based on, it's the, it's supposedly the, the sequel to Overworked Shinobi for the PS2. So nice. it's like a Shinobi sequel. And Kunoichi actually means female ninja in, nice. in Japanese. So it's, it's kind of got that devil may cry kind of I ba- see that. bayonetta kind of hack and slash thing going on. I I never actually played this on the mm-hmm. PS2. Maybe some of our listeners did. I don't know. Did you play it at all? No, I haven't. I haven't played it. There yeah. was a lot of games on the PS2 that I missed. That was all during my college years where I was extremely poor. <laughs> right. So I mean, and for me too. Like I I didn't. There was a a period of where I was just like I picked up games that I wanted to play and I wasn't like yeah eh, you know whatever. But it was composed by Fumie uh, Kumatani, uh, Tomonori Sawada, and Kichi Sugiyama, and also Yutaka Minobe. And I believe that they're all Sega in-house composers, but Mm -hmm. Kumatani is probably the most well-known out of the the whole group for contributing to a lot of big-name titles like... Nights into Dreams, Burning Rangers on the Saturn, which you know very of course, well. Of course, yeah. Also, Sonic Adventure on the Dreamcast and uh, Fantasy Star Online on the Dreamcast. Nice. So, yeah, I the, actually have both of those. Yeah. That's awesome. So, I mean, Sega in-house composers, they do a lot of stuff all over the board. Oh, and of course. I mean, Sega has such a diverse style of games that they do. I mean, pretty much every type of game from super fun, happy to very dark, Sega's and it, got it. And it's it. funny because, you know, like we've said in previous episodes, you know, Sega's cash cow is the arcade right and even though that they stick to or they've you know primarily done a lot of their releases on the in the arcades they have such a spectrum of games that they mm-hmm. they represent and composers get to play with all sorts of different formats and different, yeah, genres different hardware and stuff, so. and, and, and stuff like that yeah it's great no it was a it was a fun track though and i heard it it came on um when i was just listening on random i was like i oh, mean this is sweet like this is going into the expansion pack for sure so yeah i can totally see that kind of snapping you back from whatever you're doing and just being like wow this is really cool i kind of feel like that energy and it really just from listening to the music i can see how it could fit into like a female ninja hack and slash type game with that that really uh cool beat that just makes it feel like awesome fighting and then that little piano thing that still makes it feel like there's emotion to the whole thing there's some kind of like delicacy to right. like what you're doing this art of you know ninjutsu or you know whatever but the, the i did watch a playthrough a little bit on like you some youtube thing i just to kind of see what the game is about because i wanted to at least see something you know right. and it looks all right there there's you know it's ps2 kind of early still i you know ps2 was already outside of that early like polygon era where right. it wasn't just like hideous to go back to so it did look pretty clean but at the same time i think this kind of fell into that probably didn't need to buy kind of game yeah um it didn't really seem that unique i mean correct me if i'm wrong any any of you guys listening but when i was watching it, i was like eh, there's nothing really that stands out that i'm like oh man i want to go check this out there was some cool things though like right so she has this i was watching and she has this like spell that she can do where she basically like disappears and like reappears in a new location. Mm-hmm. And so there, there is some kind of elements to that kind of hack and slash that would make it kind of fun. But right. I, you know, without playing it, I can't really give my honest judgment on it. But at the same time, it's not something I would just normally pick up. Right. And I mean, in that, that style, like you said, like devil may cry Bayonetta, like they have to have some type of hook to them that makes them different because just hacking and slashing, just hitting a couple buttons and, you know, having a few different combos can get really old. So yeah. you need something. To there has of, to be that element. Yeah. That, that just element makes that grabs it you. complex or it's, like something that holds your attention. That's challenging, I guess. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people may hate me for saying this, but I, I never got into Devil May Cry. Like I know you did, but yeah. I it's not that I didn't like it. It's just I, I, I got to the point where I was just like, I wasn't into the series. Right. And by the time, you know, like later games came out devil may cry games i had already been kind of displaced from it for so long i was like yeah well it's kind of too late the same thing for assassin's creed for me like i just couldn't yeah. get into that i know a lot of people love it and are super into it and i wish i could get into it but it's i kind of feel like i i missed my window to get right, into it right, so right. well i mean now you can pick up a lot of those games for super cheap and try to run through them but you know yeah say like god of war they're all you know hack right. slash but one of the things that i really liked about some of the newer ones is they've made some of the combos so complex that you it really takes a lot of skill to pull off these insane tricks right. and, and like 
like hundred hit combos and you know it's really hard. Well, that's what I cool. liked about Bayonetta too. They just came out on the Wii U, mm-hmm. and it. I mean that that game was it, it blew my mind. Like yeah. I, it's super pro- fast paced, nuts. Very I mean, we're, very. We're cool. definitely gonna have to look into some of that Beautiful. music from the first one and stuff like right, that. Right, so. right. And if you bought, I believe if you bought the if you bought Bayonetta two, it comes with Bayonetta one yeah. too. So. Yeah, definitely check that out. Anyways, what's up next on your list, James? So I'm taking us back to 1991 with a Nintendo Famicom game called Radia Senki Raymahan, and the track is called Opening. <laughs> heard opening from Radia Senki Raymahan on the Nintendo Famicom, composed by Kenji Yamagishi, Rika Shigeno, and Kaori Nakarai, published and developed by Tecmo. That is super intense and really Ninja Gaiden. Yeah, no, I had... That was my first thought. Yeah, and- I could totally see that when, once you mentioned that. And I mean, when I was listening to the albums on Random... There was so much of this music that popped up from this game and I had jotted down so many of them and then I had such a hard time narrowing it down to just one track. And I thought this one was so cool because of that really intense loop that it has in the beginning. And then you expect, okay, you know, it's did like four or five loops and then you expect the rest of that track is just going to be looping. But it, then it's like, nope. It, it, and it just it gets does. even more intense, which yeah. is cool. And it actually has an ending too. So yeah. it's way cool. And no, so when I was listening, I... I immediately thought, and when you said the composer too, I was like, up, oh, that's right. I mean, you like, that's, that's it. So I, it sounds like this could go in a Ninja Gaiden game, but this is his style. He has this really intense, mm-hmm. like in your face, you know, yeah, I mean, personality like in his music. Nuts. And it's, it's really, really cool. I, I dig that track. That was a good pick. Yeah, I mean, and Kenji Yamagishi, like you said, Ninja Gaiden, great. He did one and three. Uh, we actually talked about him for a different game from episode two with uh, Captain Tsubasa. Um, oh, Super two, Strikers. Super Strikers, yeah. yeah. Which, oh, um, man, that was, was so sick. So cool. Such a great album. Um, and then we also have things I jotted down. He had done uh, Win Back for the Nintendo N64. 64. Yeah. Yeah, I had that game. And I know it wasn't like an amazing game, but I, I had a lot of fun playing it. It was really cool. And then. Um, one of the the big ones that I was really excited to see that he was involved with was Guitaro Man. Oh, so, yes. Yeah, was, like for the PS2, which was so oh, cool. That was my jam. I yeah, the game is super game. fun. But uh, yeah, I mean, amazing music, super intense. I mean, I can't imagine like playing Guitaro Man to some of his music. It's oh, just nuts. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So, and we had listed a few other composers, um, but he was the big one from that group. So, right. And, um, you know, Tecmo has great music, great games. This one I didn't know anything about, and um, it's kind of like it's kind of like um, the Legend of Zelda, right? Yeah, it's a it's a single player RPG, but instead of it being turn based battling, it resembles a lot more of like the Zelda two kind of action Zelda NES style of right. action. Um, I, but, I I didn't play the game personally, like I, but I've heard about this game, and now like after you're playing the music, I'm like, man, I really should go. Oh back no, and I this. want to bad because this game actually when it first came out in Japan. They were planning on bringing it to the U.S. and they actually made the game, but it, for some reason it was never released. It never came over here. So they actually localized it and everything. Yeah, it was ready to go, I guess, and they never released it for some reason. There was an English fan translation that made it here. Okay, um, so it is there is a possible there way is to a play way to play it, it right? Um, but it just sounded really cool. The more I read about the game, it just sounded awesome. So it it has that that um, RPG element, but you're you're in a group and you're running around and you're controlling one player when the other players are doing stuff so are those like on your on your team are they like part of your party or yeah so that yeah so they're part of your party i think you can have up to four people just like a lot of rpgs right but since it's uh, not turn-based they're all running around and you can give them actions and i thought one of the coolest things was you could give them an action to play dead so you can tell your other players, and I think you can switch between the different okay, characters on the cool. team. So and you can tell them, like, oh, your health is low. Play dead, and they'll leave you alone and, so, until we get out of this battle. So I, I oh, thought it was so cool. You can, cool. like, give them commands, 
and stuff like Why that. Why are so, we not playing this game right now? I know like, it sounds this, fun. I want to do. I would love to do an episode on this game. Like, that that would be a good one. That would be a very good one. The music sounds great. The game sounds really cool. From what I saw, the plot follows the, uh, the group of characters, and the one of the main ones he has amnesia, which I mean is like just every, as convenient in games as it is in real life. Ev- just every other RPG video game, right. action RPG, the main character. I mean, this actually reminds me a lot of Ease. I'm actually playing the Memories of Silsetta right now. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because you have a, a group of three people and you can switch between them. And just like the other Ease games, you can switch mm-hmm. between them, have your other party members do certain actions. Your main character has amnesia and it's like, they're playing all the cards in the book, you know? Right. I mean, and this is for the Famicom. So this is really early and being able to have a lot of cool commands like that. I mean, yeah, like the amnesia oh, thing. Man. You I mean, won me over, dude. Like, I want to, I want to get this going right now. This sounds so awesome. Yeah. I mean, and then another cool fact that I found was that not only did it share the composer from Ninja Gaiden, but it also shared the same director. Oh, okay. Um, so Very cool. Hideo Yoshizawa. Okay. I don't, I'm, I'm, is it Hideo? Oh yeah, Hideo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, so Hideo Yoshizawa, uh, which he did Ninja Gaiden. So it's it it's going to be really cool. I'm, I'm guessing. So. And so Ninja Gaiden too, like I, I'm not Ninja Gaiden too, but Ninja Gaiden as well. Like had this amazing story it was delivering on the 8 bit console. It had this, you know, it was an action game, and the story wasn't. Uh, I want to say it was it wasn't too embellished it was right. it was shortened to the point but it had these very cinematic cut scenes and it had it told this really cool story in a very limited amount of space and right. to see that director probably doing something similar in this type of game where he has a little bit more freedom with the storyline yeah. i'd love to see how that plays out yeah That's i mean very in rpgs we've seen have a lot more detailed story than you know in action yeah, an RPG, action game. or but, an action game yeah yeah i mean for uh, an early NES game, Ninja Gaiden, had a lot of story element that it brought to the table, whereas other games we've talked about, like Castlevania and stuff like that, a lot of their story's more hidden. It's just kind of like, oh, you're a dude, and you're running around. They don't give you a lot of story elements except for maybe in the very beginning. Right. Whereas um, Ninja Gaiden and other games, they carry that story throughout cutscenes throughout the game. So, so this director is definitely uh, one to, to keep an eye on. I mean, well, he was one to keep an eye on back in the, the 90s, but yeah. I mean, I'm really, really excited to try this out now. So yeah, and, and for- this is a perfect example of why we are excited to do these kinds of episodes because I didn't know about this game. You didn't know about this game. We found the music is insane. And now we want to do an episode later on about this. So I think that would be <laughs> that's cool. awesome. So, I mean, these episodes, these expansion packs are bringing up more ideas. Oh, yeah. We already have so many ideas, but we have more <laughs> ideas. now. We have more things that we can bring to the table. Anyways, yeah. so the next on my list is actually from the PC Engine. And it's called Fushigi no Yume no Alice. And the track you're going to hear is called The Vegetables. That was The Vegetables from Fushigi no Yume no Alice on the PC Engine, composed by Atsuko Iwanaga. Wow, that was awesome. That track was so cool. Yeah, it wasn't that rad? Yeah, it was just like the whole track, you just kept getting new stuff and more and more and more. And you thought, okay, it's ready to loop now. And then it just 
really picks it up and there's that awesome section with like that really just strong bass. bass. Yeah. Right. And, and then it just keeps going on from there. And it's like, when is this thing going to loop? And it was just so, it was beautiful, yeah. beautiful track. And it's just, it felt like there was so much to it. There's kind of like, so in the track, there's kind of like, you, you have that deep bass going on the whole time, mm-hmm. you know, and then there's kind of like these dreamy kind of bells that are playing and it, it sounds, it sounds kind of goofy and, but it's got a it's got a really cool it's got a really cool melody and yeah, then, it felt whimsical and you know it kind of fun but like not like an overly silly feel to it but it had like a fun whimsical feel to me where it was kind of like dreaming and bizarreness maybe so. right and and Fushigi no Yume no Alice uh, the rough translation is like Alice's like mysterious dream mm-hmm. um, I guess that's the best translation and you know it, it's based on Alice in Wonderland kind of it kind of has that. Yeah. that that Alice in Wonderland um, kind of motif, I think that they're, yeah. they're they're bringing out, but it's not directly stated anywhere. I don't think, but it's a really cool game. It's it's a two D platformer where you you play as Alice and you're this blonde haired girl wearing a pink dress, and your job is to make sure that you get through the forests and caves, which are all the the levels, and mm-hmm. you have to defeat enemies. But um, to defeat them, you have to either jump on their heads or you have to yell at them. Okay. Yeah. To, so it's like a combination of Mario and Wagyan. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. And so sometimes the enemies will drop like eggs and stuff and they'll explode and you can kick those eggs and use them to destroy other enemies. Okay. There's three levels, each with their, their own areas and stuff like that. And each level ends with defeating a boss. So I kind of watched a little bit of a playthrough on it. I didn't mm-hmm. actually play through it myself, but we have it, you know, to, to check out sometime so me and you should yeah. go through it and just you know pop no, it mean, on that music was beautiful i would love to to try that out and to me i also it felt like a credits song to me like it had like this kind of like, like oh you're it's done. over yeah like i can i could just imagine credits rolling and that being a really cool track and yeah so the the game was published and developed by face and they've done a lot of other games, like a lot of Japanese-only games and stuff. But it came out in 1990 on my eighth birthday, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I obviously never played it as a child, so I don't have any past memories with it. But it does seem something like it would be fun to go back and check out. Yeah. For no. sure. And PC Engine, you know, it's one of my uh, hidden affairs i think in right. console gaming i i love the pc engine so much and no you've won me over with the pc engine it's on my very high on my list of systems to pick up and games that i'm just like wow this is awesome so, yeah because like the last time like i came back from japan after visiting family like we i i picked up all these hue yeah. cards and like i mean i already had a, just this yeah, you got like a whole bucket full of them. <laughs> yeah, I have this insane like, collection this already. In. This is awesome. And I had like a ton of other stuff, and we just like threw it on. And you mm-hmm. know, I'm glad that you were you were converted to it. Oh yeah, I mean it's nuts. The thing is so tiny, and to see what it can do at how small it is, and then for some reason when it came to the U.S. with the Turbo Graphics 16, they made it like ten times bigger to do it, the same thing. Right. I had friends with Turbo Graphics, and I I liked it, and I always thought it was cool, but that I think the PC Engine, I wish they would have kept that form factor when they brought it here because it's mm-hmm. so small and so it's just an, an awesome system. Well, I mean, and we had talked about that um, on a possible reason why it was so big because here in the U.S., everyone was getting like VCRs and, right. and stereos, so everything was big, so maybe if it came over and it was small, people were like, Oh, this is nothing. I'm going to just overlook this. This is a little crappy machine where it's like this big machine. It's like, you know, like cars are big and it's like this makes it's <laughs> right. awesome and powerful. It's a muscle car, but it's like, there's so much wasted space. I know it. And it's so tiny. And for a system that came out in 87, it's, um, yeah. it's remarkably small. And yeah. you know, the, and the hue cards themselves are like, yeah. you can fit a whole bunch of them in your pocket, right? They're like credit card size, a little thicker. And, yeah. but anyways, this game is really cool. Atsuko Iwanaga, she did a lot of stuff on the arcade, a lot of okay. stuff for face in the arcade and or for other companies as well. And a lot of Famicom ports of arcade games as well as sound programming for the Famicom games. So she did, she was very versatile, did a lot of mm-hmm. programming as well as composition. So. Well, we see that with a lot of composers, is, right. especially early on. The early composers. Very you know, diverse. They can work on multiple systems with multiple hardware, which yeah. is really cool. Anyways, what do you have next on the list for us? Um, next, I have Shaggy the Wolf, um, which is a DOS game. And the track that I have is Final Boss.
You just heard Final Boss from Shaggy the Wolf on DOS, composed by DAC or DAC. I'm not sure how you would really pronounce that. Yeah, I, I don't know. DAC, DAC, either one I'm sure is okay. That uh, track was pretty cool, actually. It, yeah, no, I, I it came up. I didn't know anything about the game, never seen anything about it. And um, when I was looking into it, the music was awesome. But unfortunately, it sounds like the gameplay is not. <laughs> really? Yeah, no. You know, I, I did look it up a little bit and because i was curious too and it it looks like a so it's like a 2d platformer right yeah and it's not um uh, a u.s or a japanese game it's uh, from a korean based company it was developed by family production and published by micro forum international so um it's not I, I thought it was cool that it was not something normal that we would talk about so um but you know the music's awesome, but unfortunately the gameplay. Everyone, everywhere I looked, even the videos that I watched on it, it just seemed kind of boring and not great. Okay. So but, what what is Shaggy the Wolf all about? So um, you play as Shaggy, um, who is supposed to be a wolf, but looks a lot more like a fox. Or it's a very cartoony looking thing. She's orange, um, so okay. that you would think like gray or brown. It's or, a but, she. Uh, I, I think it's a she. I thought I uh, read somewhere that it was supposed to be a she. It doesn't really matter. It, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, it just didn't look that great. There, I mean, it was a, a platformer. There's you know jumping around stuff like that. Should be pretty easy to make something that's at least fun. But it it was wasn't very fun. Um, there's seven stages, um, each with a mid boss and an end boss. Okay. And it's you know melee attacking so it's nothing special there didn't seem to be anything unique about the game at all yeah you know i i saw screenshots and stuff of it when i i was kind of looking it up and it looks very it's weird it's like a kind of a super nintendo kind of look to it it's right. got like this 16-bit look to it but the mechanics and everything look very very dated yeah um for for 1996 that, right you know? so this is not early at all so um but really it did surprised. get it did get a US release, right? So I mean, there were people that cared about this enough to bring it, you know, overseas. So I don't know. Maybe there's some people out there who are like, oh my God, they're talking about my favorite game. You know, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But Yeah. No, the music is upbeat. It's cool. It, I mean, it seems like it would fit a a lot of different genres of game and you know, yeah, having it as great. a action platformer, it it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and like I said, with the, the previous track I picked, uh, I didn't know anything about it. And a lot of the music was popping up for me and I wrote down a lot of it. So um, I was very impressed with the soundtrack for this game. And I I would like to look into it some more. Um, it was very, you know, fun sounding and just great dynamic uh, to it. It right. felt like it had so much more character to the music than the game did. Uh, so. Right. And, and looking at the screenshots, like it doesn't have... It's funny because it falls in that line where it doesn't look like American artists or right. British artists or, you know, or European artists, and it doesn't look like Japanese artwork either. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a weird combination. So if you look at the sprite work and stuff, it doesn't look like something that we've seen in mm -hmm. or we would normally see in like a Super Nintendo or uh, even like further back like um, NES. Genesis. You know, it doesn't look. It doesn't have those that pixel art that we would yeah we would see from. Or that we're used to from, you know, like I said, artists from U.S., you know, Europe and Japan. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but it has a different artistic style to it that doesn't seem as something that we're we're used to. Right. And I think I even when I saw the, the cover for it, it looked like uh, like a 3D rendered version of Shaki. So, you know what uh, it reminded me of? It reminded me of Bubsy. Yeah. It reminded or, me of me, Bubsy's and, cover. And a little bit of uh, Crash Bandicoot, I felt, was mixed in there to the look a little bit. Like an early, like they were trying to do like this early kind of like CGI kind of polygon, like yeah. texture mapping, like render yeah. it like, as... Let's make the cover cool and... And then it's just like this pixel art. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Um, yeah. And, and when I looked it up, I, unfortunately, it seemed like the game had no saving at all in it so and there's well, no you, password features either so, so you have to play through in one sitting yeah so you have to be ready you have to be ready to play jesus <laughs> they definitely uh okay which all is right. it just lends to the the fact that maybe the game wasn't 
planned out as much or wasn't the game itself wasn't the focus it was maybe sales or you know like let's put a game out and see if people buy it and not right. really think about making the best possible game we can. maybe they bundled it in with like some other software that came out at the time well, or that's possible like that, too that yeah anyways why don't we move over to my track um, I'm pretty stoked about this. This game is for the Sega Saturn. Mm -hmm. The game is Black Matrix, and the track is called Samson. That was Samsung from Black Matrix on the Sega Saturn, published in 1998, composed by The Hustler's Concept. Pretty wow. awesome track. Yeah. No, and, and um, I think you said this was left over from the last expansion pack. Right, right. Yeah. And I had picked some tracks from this episode or this game as well. And I was like, oh, I knew that you were going to do some. So I decided to hold off. And this is an awesome one. I, I really like it. It's what very a, different. Very cool. It's got that. Um, you were saying when we were listening to it, like, oh, man, it's like a garage band, like practice, yeah. practicing like in the back, you know, down, the, down the block. No, it's really cool. It's got that. Um, like first thing came to my head was like, oh, man, this is like Soundgarden or like the Toadies or something from like the 90s, yeah. that rock era, you know, so. I, I thought it was way cool. The Hustlers concept, there's actually, it's comprised of a few different composers. There is, um, let's see here, Katsunari Kitajima and Hiroshi Taniguchi. And those that's kind of in question because I, I try to look a little bit into the Hustlers concept. And mm -hmm. I think it's just like a bunch of different guys that got together to do various different, you know, soundtracks here and there. Yeah. Not just game audio, but like other... Right you know audio and stuff and um it's it's pretty cool song though i i i really think it's super energetic and the game itself is not what you would expect to hear you wouldn't expect to hear this kind of music in this kind of right. game i'll explain that in a second there but yeah i mean for me i'm i am very into box art as well and this game has awesome box art and when i heard this music that goes with it i was like wow this that's not what i expected at all but I was still excited and I know how much you love Sega Saturn. So I was like, uh, I want to try this. Game I, I actually sure. have the physical copy of both black matrix one and this, the sequel black nice. matrix two. And um, it was published by NEC international and developed by flight plan. It's a really cool game. Actually um, it's, it never was localized here. So mm -hmm. we, you know, we don't get to have a English translation, but it's a tactical RPG like final fantasy tactics or, something along those lines tactics over something like that mm -hmm. but it has this really it's it's interesting because it has like a religious theme that deals with the nature of good and evil mm -hmm. so you play as like i want to say like angels versus demons mm -hmm. and so like your characters will have wings and stuff like that and it's very but they they look very cool um as far as like the sprite work goes the game has beautiful artwork yeah it's it's very very detailed all the sprites have simple animations when they're standing still so like the npcs will be standing there like reading a book and it looks like they're opening and the sprite work is so well done nice i was so impressed and um another thing that is 
interesting about the game is that I, I mentioned this religious theme. Well, the forces of hell basically won mm-hmm. this decisive war against you know Earth or wherever they're they're fighting, mm-hmm. and um, so you're the forces of heaven, and you're trying to kind of overcome the evil and kind of take it back. Yeah, yeah so. I didn't actually play the game. I, I mean, other than a few minutes of popping it in and trying it. And mm-hmm. I, I definitely want to go back and play it now after listening to the music and stuff. But it's it's very interesting because all of the um, cut scenes, they're still done with sprite work and, mm-hmm. you know, different kinds of... Yeah, and that's that's cool for the Saturn since they didn't have to do sprite work. They, they didn't... Could have well, done. Yeah, the Saturn wasn't that great with 3D, obviously, too. So it... It's cool that they left it as sprite work, but the, the cool thing about it is the artwork. What I was going to say is that the artwork, so like an RPG, when you have like the, the character who's talking, the, the artwork comes up large next to the text. Yeah. It also has voiceovers and the voiceovers are very, very well done. That's I was, cool. I was listening to like the intro. I played about 30, 40 minutes of it when I, when I bought the game originally and um, I was blown away because the voice acting is so well polished and so well done. It sounds very 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 well thought out and it's just it was a really cool game and the soundtrack is soundtrack is phenomenal yeah i mean it sounds like every aspect of the game they knocked it out of the park with the look the the story sounds very interesting the music is great the gameplay sounds awesome so it's uh it definitely sounds like something we'd want to try out yeah and you know from what i played um i like i played this years ago and so i can't really remember the story but I don't remember it being too, too overly, too over the top as far mm-hmm. as, you know, like just text, 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 text. There's a lot of quick action that you can get into right off the bat. Cause I think it was like I was 15 minutes in and mm-hmm. I was already in a tactical battle. So it was really, really cool. No, oh, that's good. Yeah. When they jump right in. Um, next up, I want to take us way to the, the future into modern times and i wanted to to take and play a track from a game that has deep roots in you know retro gaming and is still putting out great hits with amazing music so i wanted to play harvest hazards underwater from donkey kong country tropical freeze on the wii u Oh, 
you just heard Harvest Hazards Underwater for Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze on the Wii U, composed by David Wise. I was waiting for you to drop a Tropical Freeze track someday. I wasn't sure when, but it was going to happen. Right, and these, these types of episodes are great to, to show not only old stuff, but how some of it, it is like the new stuff still has some of that feel. And David Wise is incredible. We've, we've talked about him a bunch oh. of times. Um, way back in the beginning, he was doing stuff on the NES with like Marble Madness. Um, in the last episode, the last expansion back episode, I uh, played a track called Sesame Street 1, 2, 3. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and Battletoads. So, I mean, he's done stuff way in the beginning and he's done stuff throughout the years. And his music is beautiful on every system every different hardware every you know everything that they throw at him he just knocks it out of the park and he just shows like his skill that no matter what system he's on he can do something amazing where we've seen composers where their early stuff is incredible their later stuff's not that great or vice versa where the limitations they you know they might jump onto a system that has less limitations and their music just is not quite as memorable but david wise is just incredible he's a composer that is system in specific, like yeah. it doesn't matter the platform, but he is just a genius anywhere he goes. This is the first soundtrack that he is credited as the main composer for that he's done in like over 10 years. Yeah. So it's it's like 10 years without doing being the credited composer. I mean, I'm sure he's helped out with, right. you know, a lot of other things and done producing and stuff for other soundtracks. But it's just amazing that he can jump in and be like, oh, I'm going to own this. And yeah. I'm gonna bring back. Well, I mean, and he's worked one all the donkey like a ton of donkey kong stuff you know all the donkey kong country you know things diddy kong racing so i mean he's developed an amazing style and for me when donkey kong first started becoming really big i remember um playing donkey kong country on the super nintendo and thinking oh this is going to be like a lot of bongos and a lot of like really cheesy like you know like something really really super cheesy and i was blown away like absolutely blown away by the soundtracks for those games and there's that's what some of my favorite music right. ever and i could sit there and lay in bed and listen to these tracks all day like that's it's just, what made donkey kong country i think as memorable as it is is the music i think that people remember that composition from david wise you know donkey kong country because you know that the gameplay is fun and everything but without that music if the, if the music was done by somebody who just didn't really truly care about it mm-hmm. i don't think it would have had the fame that it has today i really believe i really believe oh that. no of course i mean they yeah with you know when they they did that first one they had that interesting look it was different than no than everyone else was doing but that's not enough to carry a series on until today and still putting out amazing games i mean tropical freeze is gorgeous from beginning to end the gameplay is fun it's challenging it's not just oh you know a walk in the park so but it's not overly difficult to where it's frustrating so it's just was a perfect game with beautiful music and um, it's a ton of tracks. I mean, there's a lot of music in this and game. So I want to also bring up that there's, so you, you said there's a lot of tracks, but what makes this track unique is that in Harvest Hazards, there's already music for the level, but right. it's this music actually, you only hear it when you actually go underwater. Right. So, so it, there's the Harvest Hazards actually, track, and then there's Harvest Hazards Underwater, and they do that a bunch throughout the game, which is really cool. Right, and it, it's it's funny because there's, you know, it's hard to do water music, and you, we hear a lot of examples of different, like, under-the-sea kind of, you know, tracks. Yeah. Some are done very, very well, but Wise always seems to hit it correctly it's something makes it feel like you're you are underwater yeah like at least for me and you can hear the same melody carry over right like if you were on top of ground and and that that track that even outside of the water is amazing and bringing it under is really cool yeah so yeah it had that really cool combination of it's a similar track but it's different and like, and the water uh, the, I really loved all the underwater parts. Like he swims really cool. The little seaweeds like floating back and forth. The water special effects were amazing. And you know, it's just an awesome game. And I, and like I said, I, I love seeing that deep history with a game and showing how um, there are still modern games that are putting out great music that are not just that Hans Zimmer, like background music type stuff that there are games that are going to put out songs that, you know, in 15 years from now, 20 years people from now, will be like, they're going to make, that's a retro game that I love the music to. Right. And you know, it's funny because this was I, a tropical freeze was probably my platformer. It, I mean, for sure. It was my platformer of 2014, yeah, my number here. one. And I love that game played it all the way through. 
couldn't couldn't stop. And th- there's a lot of games like even you know I want to say like Mario 3D Land or 3D World. I I played and I got really into and I I I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I didn't have that that kind of hankering to keep keep right. going and try to collect everything. And and that was like the first game like platform in a while on the Wii U that I was just like, oh man, mm-hmm. I got it can't stop i gotta yeah no it's it's a definite buy for the wii u if you have one and you're you're still not sure what games to get this is a great game right and it's it's very challenging too um a lot of you know people say there's a lot of easy games and stuff that you know games hold your hand nowadays but this doesn't this does not and it really is a challenge and you have to really learn the rhythms and the patterns of the levels in order to to make it all the way through and especially to collect all the the items right so yeah i letters and stuff and the like yeah that was great what you said about the levels are they're, they're not similar to each other they do a lot of really cool things and all the bosses are completely different like yeah they all have their tells and their their things that kind of give away what they might do next but every boss is very very different i right. mean and the, you know donkey kong has it's a simple type of game you can jump on things you can swing from things so there's the not concept a, is very very basic yeah but, but like, they do so much with it yeah the way that you have to attack and and beat the bosses is very very unique so it's really cool right we could talk about tropical freeze all day oh of course but we're gonna move over to the arcade and the track i have is from a game called hippodrome and the track title is called Big the Powerful Monster. heard big the powerful monster for hippodrome released in 1989 in the arcade i could totally see this as an arcade track it's very um grab your attention and it's very aggressive and which i thought was pretty cool and the synth in it is is really cool it's Mm -hmm. super like shrill and like ear piercing and just like makes you want to like fight yeah yeah so the game was published and developed by daddy east and it was composed by azusa hara Hiroaki Yoshida, Hitomi Komatsu, and Hiroyuki. Those are all the credited composers, mm-hmm. and they all worked for Daddy East. So, you know, Azusa Hara did a lot of stuff for Daddy East arcade titles like Heavy Barrel, Bad Dudes, Bloody Wolf, Cobra Command, a, a lot of different uh, Daddy East titles. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, she passed away in the 90s. Oh, wow. So we won't be hearing anything new from her. But it, she has a very very interesting and cool repertoire of music to, yeah, no, that she's great. composed for. Yeah, very cool. Hiroaki Yoshida, he did um, Robocop, which I know you I dig love. and I love too, uh, from 1988. And we really love the uh, music from from that title. It's so vibrant, so energetic. Mm-hmm. And um, he did a lot of sound direction and sound effects too, not just composition. Mm-hmm. So he was more into the direction and and effects and stuff like that that's cool and hitomi komatsu did more a lot of i want to say sound design Mm -hmm. as well so less composition more sound design not not really much in you know actual composition credits but so even though all of them worked on it they they kind of worked more as a team than where a whole bunch of composers like some of them are like i know about composing so i can help out but it was still kind of like here's the composer he, this one's going to do a little bit more sound design. This one's going to fill it out with, you know, stuff like that. And so. this was a time where a lot of these, you know, credited roles and stuff were very, very gray. And right. we don't have a definite, unless we get word from the actual composer, we don't have an extremely definitive, you know, 
cut and dry like this is the composer the, the, yeah. the, those are the people that were involved in the music but we can't say it was actually only this person or this person yeah. did this job or this role and they probably bounced around a lot too based on whatever their supervisors had them work on so. right i mean and one of them may have done one track from the game and another one did a different track and i mean so it's kind of hard to tell exactly who did which one but excellent excellent stuff and, and i could see too with them, them all being data working for data east that they would build a little bit of a team that would work together on a game instead of like here's the one person that's going to do it or let's have all three of you guys do it so you can do multiple tracks all at once and right done and they fast, but... and they had less titles that they were publishing at that time too yeah. like instead of releasing like 20 games a year or these multi-million dollar games like once they you would have several titles mm -hmm. and so there would be a little bit more freedom to work on like you know let's have all of our guys work on this yeah. until we release it and then we'll work on the next project but the game itself let me talk a little bit about hippodrome it was released here as hippodrome but in japan it's actually called uh fighting fantasy and so there's two totally different titles yeah. but the game is actually kind of cool it's a it's not really amazing but it's a fighting game but it is really unique you play as a warrior and you challenge eight or nine different opponents like medusa who looks totally rad she's got this nice. really long tail and you're in this coliseum which is 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 very cool so it's like kind of like i want to say to give you a picture it's like street fighter battling so you have your player mm -hmm. your warrior versus like this you know demon or monster or something mm -hmm. like that and you're just basically fight it's like boss battles nice like, oh yeah yes. it. so everyone pretty much plays as the same character you play as the same character the whole way through okay and you just our pit against these different opponents. But I mean like, so say if um, you were to play it and then I was to go play it, would I play as the same person you would that you play did? As, or? You would play as the same character. There's okay. only one playable okay. that's, character. I guess that's what I was getting for, at. Yeah, yeah for, the, for the actual player. So it, cool. it's really cool though. So like I said, there's Medusa, there's a gargoyle, scorpion kind of man thing. What makes it unique is that, so it's a, just a two button game. You have jump and attack, but the joystick is eight way directional. Mm -hmm. So like when you swing your sword, you can actually swing up at an angle straight up behind you nice. to the diagonals and down. And so you have a full range of motion for your sword, which is really, really cool for an early fighting game. And I, I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah. So I was looking a little bit into the history. It's named after the outer planes described in the Dungeons and Dragons cosmology. Mm -hmm. So it kind of does have this kind of back roots that they, they looked into it. And like, ah, why don't we use kind of steal this design or, or more like concept mm -hmm. to create this, to fabricate this world. So it's, it's pretty cool. But Hippodrome actually in ancient Greece is, is more of a race circuit for horse-drawn chariots kind of like ben-hur style uh -huh. whereas like this kind of gladiatorial type fighting that you do in hippodrome is more like a roman coliseum so it's yeah. weird that they chose that so the, name the it terminology really is a little off maybe but um... it's a little bit skewed but the the soundtrack is really cool each boss has their own stage in the hippodrome mm -hmm. and uh each boss has their own subsequent music nice theme to go with it as well so it's pretty cool we haven't heard actually a lot from this sound chip on our show yet. This is the um, YM2203, and this is the, and the sound CPU is the M6502. It's used in that. It's the same hardware as the arcade for Heavy, heavy Barrel, Bad Dudes, RoboCop, and stuff like that, nice. other arcade games that fit that, that time for Data East. So it's really cool because we haven't played something from this sound chip yet in the show. Yeah, I know. That was really awesome. I, I really like the track. It was very cool. It, it definitely made me feel like i could be into the fight like um it, you know it had like a, a darker feel to it to where you know it's not going to be like a super bright happy type you know fun fight it game. does it's, have a very gladiatorial yeah. kind of kind of striking fast pace but at the same time like get business done you know mm -hmm. slay this enemy and it's it's really cool Anyways, let's move along. We're kind of going along here today. What uh, do you have next? It'll be our last track. Yeah, so my final track, I'm going to do... Um, the song is called Game Start uh, from King Kong 2, Ikari No Megaton Punch on the Nintendo Famicom.
You just heard Game Start from King Kong 2 Ikari no Megaton Punch from the Nintendo Famicom, developed and published by Konami. And we have four composers for this game, which are Shinya Sakimoto, Satoe Terashima, Ki Nuyo Yamashita, and Kiyohiro Sada. Very cool track. King Kong 2, one of the coolest Famicom albums, in my opinion. Yeah, it was great. Weird game. Uh, I played it. I played this game like quite a few times actually back in the day, not when it was originally released, but later mm-hmm. on, like I was saying, like in high school going through my, you know, I miss these games phase. And uh, I love that track. It sounds extremely, it, I mean, we've said that all this all the time when we hear a Konami track, but it sounds very Konami mm-hmm. and you've got these very cool progressive melodies that just keep you interested. This whole soundtrack is phenomenal for mm-hmm. a, a Famicom you know, game. It's it's very very cool. Well, and and like this track isn't super long, and it's got a a loop feel to it, but it's still a track that I could just listen to for a long period of time. Like I could probably listen to this for like ten minutes or so, but you know, and just be like, oh, man, it's such a great track. It's just so cool the way that they use the the limitations and the notes and the melodies and the the bass and all that stuff. It's just really cool. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of like. The gameplay itself specifically reminds me a little bit of like Akari Warriors, like Akari Warriors, where you're like running around kind of in this behind the head kind of overview, like kind of Zelda top down bird's eye view. Right. And you're progressively moving forward, almost like a like a shooter, but with more of a running around, picking up different items kind of approach to it. Mm-hmm. But the the soundtrack press start the the song that we just heard, it probably wasn't meant to be played for more than. 10 seconds because this is the title screen so you're just gonna see the title and you're gonna move on from Mm -hmm. the splash screen to the gameplay yeah and that was one thing i liked about this was this was a cool track and it's you know you probably didn't listen to it a lot but the game itself like so i was i was talking a little bit about the gameplay in my experience but the reason why i brought that up is because that start track feels exactly what the game felt like to me moving forward and mm-hmm. and kind of defeating enemies that are coming up on the screen and it's it's a bizarre game i don't i, I wish i could tell you more about it because i haven't played it in so long but i do right. remember it enough to know that it had a very cool element to it for king kong 2 yeah no i have i have some info about uh kind of the story and like the backstory to the game and stuff well, like that well, let's so, hear it so the game is obviously based on the, you know, that old 1933 original King Kong movie where, right. you know, at the end of the movie, he's on, you know, the building, the the planes are shooting at him and he falls and he dies, but he doesn't. <laughs> so basically <laughs> what happens is he's in a coma for 10 years. But the interesting thing is, so the original movie came out in 1933. They've had uh, four or five different movies that have come out since then, right, um, right. Which, you know, were like the son of Kong and things like that. Yeah. So yeah. in 1986, when this game came out earlier in the year, they released the movie that this game is based on where right, King Kong, right, okay. he survived. He's been in a coma for 10 years. Oh, that's interesting. So and what happens is they find a, a female Kong that is just as big and they do a blood transfusion and they give him an artificial heart. God, this is way too detailed for King Kong, but right, continue, continue. So, and so then he wakes up from the coma cause he's got all this new blood and a new heart, which I don't know why they would give him to this giant animal. So he wakes up and he decides, Oh, I'm, I'm ready to procreate. So, <laughs> so he wakes oh up, God. he breaks out and he, uh, goes after this lady Kong um, to, and she's in captivity. So he wants to rescue. Sounds her. like the next course of action, right? Find I yourself mean, a nice lady. Kong. Got to create some other Kongs. So, um, so, and then the game consists of nine levels, things like the military facility, mountain ranges, jungles, cities, stuff like that. So it seems really cool. They're, they're kind of maze like levels. So the games had a really interesting story to it. And, uh, sounds really cool and the music is awesome so it's something that i want to try out. i never i never knew that about it i never knew there was actual story behind it other than i just thought you're like, all right i'm this giant like you know ape that's gonna go cause some terror around the city and right i never knew there was a story behind it that's way awesome well and that it's based on an official king kong movie which is i believe is called king kong lives or kong lives or something like that so it's not just like some weird out of nowhere like it's it's based on an actual film that was produced oh that's awesome that's very cool now the the composers 
they all have worked on some crazy awesome stuff like sakamoto did blades of steel castlevania the adventure for game boy gradius we have um Terashima worked on Vampire Killer for the MSX, um, Castlevania for NES, you know, Castlevania 2. Um, Yamashita, she worked on Castlevania, Power Blade 1 and 2, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers for the Super Nintendo, which is awesome. Uh, Mega Man Wily Wars, you know. Oh, wow. Castlevania, Harmony of Despair, which uh, is cool. And then Sada did things like Top Gun, contra on the so NES. they're all over the place yeah like so they've, they've done some amazing stuff between the four of them so very very cool anyways it's time to wrap up the show you can visit us online at pixelatedaudio.com. follow us on twitter at pixelated audio and also instagram at pixelated audio yeah and you can leave us some comments or you know questions stuff like that on any of those places we love reading all of them we definitely go through them all and read them which is great for us and it's great for the show as well yeah and feel free to leave us a review on itunes or stitcher we'd appreciate that it'd be really cool the last track taking us out of my picks is called stage two from the jungle book on the nes nice. and it was composed by neil baldwin who's a british composer and he's a very very interesting guy and mm-hmm. what i want to kind of bring up about him is that he noticed that you know there's a lack of recognition for composers and stuff back in the day there's not not a lot of documentation right and so he kind of got i don't want to say fed up but he was kind of like you know i really want to at least catalog what i've worked on and kind of give details about you know the tracks that i did and the the songs that i worked on because otherwise this is going to be lost yeah i mean take it into your own hands and write a good list and so on mr baldwin's website you can actually find all of the music he composed and he also talks a little bit about each track and what you know his thoughts were when he composed it it's very very cool i wish that's m- awesome i wish every composer did this it's the coolest thing i'll put a link to the show notes uh, or to his website in the show notes and uh, he's done other stuff like jungle book um on all the early systems game boy game gear super nes mm-hmm. nes he did james bond jr on the nes drop zone lethal weapon Dino Denny Soccer on the Super NES. He did War nice. Gods N64, Hydro Thunder, Mortal Kombat Go- Gold on the Dreamcast. And um, Jungle Book was the last NES title he did that got released So for the NES. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's really cool that he had a lot to say about it. You know, it had a massive amount of fun, or he had a massive amount of fun working on it. He said it was fun because it was the first time he'd actually transcribed anybody else's music, like the Sherman Brothers who did the Jungle Book you know, the Jungle Book soundtrack. Right. He got to actually put that in chiptune form and he had a lot of fun with that and got to got to play around with different ideas and stuff. So that's awesome. I mean, I've seen uh, documentaries on the Jungle Book movie and how unique the the music was and how they took the voice acting in a different direction and so and it's a really cool music movie so i could see like the music being translated to the I games love, being really fun. I to love do. that movie. Anyway, so stage two, uh this is kind of a transposition of the bare necessities, but it's laid back. And this is directly lifted from his website. He said, this is the bare necessities, but in like this, you know, laid back reggae style. So anyways, thanks for listening and uh, we'll see you in the next episode.